Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Drug-Free America Foundation webinar entitled Marijuana Use in Pregnancy and While Breastfeeding. My name is Karen Ballinger, and I am the Program Director for Drug-Free America Foundation. We have a few housekeeping items to share. First, everyone will be muted, and we will encourage you to write your questions in the chat box. The final 10 minutes or so will be devoted to responding to your questions. The webinar will be recorded and you will receive a link to it along with the PowerPoint and a certificate of completion. So let's get started. Here's a brief bio of our esteemed presenter. Tori Metz, MD, MS, is an associate professor and vice chair for research at the University of Utah Health. Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. She is a practicing maternal fetal medicine subspecialist. Dr. Metz completed both her medical school and residency training at the University of Colorado. She then went on to complete her maternal fetal medicine fellowship and master's of science in clinical investigation at the University of Utah in 2012. She's a member of, a, of both the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists uh, Committee on Clinical Practice Guidelines for Obstetrics and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine Publications Committee. Nationally, she also serves as the Associate Editor for Obstetrics for the Green Journal, Obstetrics and Gynecology, and is an American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology Board Examiner for both specialty and subspecialty boards. She has received numerous teaching awards, including the ACOG District 8 Mentor of the Year Award and the National Creog Award for Excellence in Resident Education. She has R01 funding from the National Institutes of Health to study the association between marijuana use and adverse pregnancy outcomes. Welcome, Dr. Metz. There we go. I just needed the permission to unmute. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for that lovely introduction for having me today. I really appreciate uh, you joining me. So I'm going to see if I can share my screen here. Hopefully I can. Yep, it looks like it's coming up. Pull these slides up. Okay, I think those are showing up okay. Um, so I'm just going to speak with you all uh, today about marijuana use in pregnancy and while breastfeeding. I don't have any conflicts of interest that are related to the content of this presentation. Uh, the objectives today are to find the prevalence of marijuana use in pregnancy and the reported reasons for use to enable you to counsel women regarding the risks of marijuana use during pregnancy and lactation based on the current evidence and to recommend and utilize available online resources when you counsel women regarding marijuana use in pregnancy and lactation. So in terms of background, a lot of this you probably already know, marijuana is the most common illicit drug used in pregnancy. It does cross the placenta and we anticipate increased use with increasing legalization of recreational marijuana. And that is happening and I'll show you some data to support that. This is just a map of the United States. And what you can see here is that marijuana is legal in a lot of places. So all the green states are with some sort of legalization. Uh, the ones that are bright green are the ones that have both recreational and medicinal legalization. And the ones in darker green are just medicinal legalization. But the bottom line is that the majority of US uh, citizens have access to legal marijuana. So what is it? Um, it's the cannabis sativa or indica plant. It contains over 600 chemicals. And THC is the psychoactive component. And this is the reason that people typically use marijuana recreationally. Um, there are also cannabidiols and these have a sedative and sometimes um, thought of as a therapeutic effect. Although I would say they make, there are pretty mixed data on whether CBD uh, has therapeutic efficacy, but it is approved for some indications. Um, and there are different modes of consumption. So smoking, vaping, eating, and topicals or lotions. So why does it matter that we have all these new modes of consumption of marijuana products? Um, it's really because of a difference in onset of action. And so when people smoke marijuana, much faster onset, five to 15 minutes, and that effect lasts one to three hours. Now, that onset um, is what people are used to, right? And the majority of patient people still use uh, marijuana via smoking. 
but there's also edibles. It has a slower onset, 30 minutes to an hour with a peak effect anywhere from one to six hours. Um, we in Colorado, when my marijuana was originally legalized and I became interested in this because I was living in Colorado at the time, um, we did see increased emergency department visits and toxicity from edible products with high concentrations of THC. And you can sort of see how that happens, right? With the slower onset of 30 minutes to an hour, you know, people go to the dispensary, they buy a product, they tell them, you know, have this little portion of chocolate, that's a serving, they have that, you know, 15 minutes go by, they're like, mm, I must just like not be very sensitive to this, I'll have another, I'll have another, and that sort of stacks up. And then by the time they actually get onset of um, the psychoactive component of the drug, then they have basically um, entered a time of toxicity. So what's the prevalence of marijuana use? The reported prevalence ranges anywhere from three to 30%. Um, there are data from the National Surveys of Drug Use and Health that provide us with some information on this and how it's increased over time. Uh, NISDA is a cross-sectional nationally representative survey. In 2002, 2.4% of, uh, of pregnant patients noted past month use, and that has increased over time. So it went up to 3.9% in 2014 and 4.9% in 2016. So we are seeing increasing use over time that goes along with increasing legalization. Um, we did a study where we looked at um, the uh, incidence of use or prevalence of use, I should say, in uh, Colorado after legalization. In this study, we obtained 116 paired samples. So we basically contacted the patient. We asked them to fill out a survey about marijuana use. We looked in their medical record to see if they'd reported marijuana use. And then we also sent a segment of their cord to be assayed for uh, marijuana metabolites. And what we found is that 2.6% of them reported use to a healthcare provider. So <clears throat> pretty low percent, that's pretty consistent across the literature, two to 3% of patients report use. 6% of them reported use in the last 30 days on this anonymous survey that we gave them. So, you know, they were more willing to tell us about use if they didn't think that their healthcare providers were gonna uh, have that information. And then we sent their umbilical cords for assay. 10% of them had a THC, um, THCA or THCCOH, which is a stable metabolite of marijuana, above the limit of quantification, which is 200 picograms per gram. So this would be what the, the clinical test threshold is. So if I were sending an umbilical cord segment for clinical testing, this is a threshold they'd use, and 10% of them had, had a positive test. Um, and then the research threshold we set a little bit lower, and 22% of them had marijuana metabolite above a research threshold. And the lab assures me that that is absolutely there. They have marijuana metabolite. The reason they set a clinical threshold that is higher because they really want to avoid any chance of a false positive. And so somewhere between the neighborhood of 10 to 20% of patients who delivered in Colorado medical centers after legalization had a detectable marijuana metabolite in their cord. So is there increase with use with legalization? That's one of the things that we were trying to ad address at that time. And there are some data about that. These are data from the US drug testing laboratories. They compared Colorado meconium lab results to other states without legalization over that same time period. So the first nine months of 2012 and 2014. And what they found is an increase by 10% in THC positive samples in Colorado. And that was consistent with the rest of the country. But the concentration of marijuana in the Colorado samples was higher. So the mean was 213 nanograms per gram uh, pre-legalization and 361 nanograms per gram post-legalization. And what they hypothesized is that patients were just having access to higher potency products and potentially increased use, resulting in higher um, marijuana metabolite in the meconium of the neonate. So why do patients use marijuana in pregnancy? This, I think, is a question that comes up a lot and a lot of people ask me about. Um, there, there is a survey uh, that's out there that uh, assesses this. This is a survey from the Tri-County Health Department where they surveyed women participating in the Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, so WIC. They have a monthly caseload of about 25,000 clients, and for this, they used a convenient sample of about 1,700 of them. And I think what's interesting here and that we have to realize when we talk about marijuana use in pregnancy is that the majority of patients who have current use, so this middle column here, really feel that they are using for a reason. It's helpful to them for some indication. So 63% of them said it was helpful for depression, anxiety, and stress. 60% said it helped with pain. And about 50% said it helped with nausea and vomiting. 
Where is this the minority or 39% who's used for fun or recreation? Now you compare that to people who you had past use and among those with past use, it's really the majority here, 65% that said, oh, I just use it for fun or recreation. So those patients who continue to use marijuana during pregnancy really do perceive a benefit of use. And I think it's important for us to talk with them about what that perceived benefit is to see if we can offer um, other safer therapies. So what do patients use it for in pregnancy? So nausea and vomiting is one thing uh, that patients say that they use marijuana for in pregnancy. Um, there are not a ton of data about this. There are definitely no data that say whether it's an effective treatment for nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. But this is a retrospective cohort study that comes out of Kaiser Northern California, where they did universal screening with urine toxicology and uh, questionnaires. And then they looked at ICD um, codes for diagnosis of nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. And they found severe nausea in 2.54%, mild nausea in about 15%. And they found that individuals who are coded as severe nausea and vomiting of pregnancy had higher odds of using marijuana. So those odds ratios are in the order of three. So 3.8 for severe nausea and vomiting of pregnancy and for mild nausea and vomiting of pregnancy, odds ratio of 2.4. But this just says that there was some relationship between marijuana use on the Utoxin questionnaire and people being coded for nausea. It doesn't say whether it treats it or not. And ICD-9 codes are difficult to use in the circumstance because we don't always code for nausea and vomiting. If patients have it and it's mild in a prenatal visit, I wouldn't necessarily put a diagnostic code in for that. So there's also an increasing perception of safety. And I think that this is notable. These are really interesting data. It was a research letter that was published in the Gray Journal, uh, AJOG, American Journal of OBGYN. And what they saw that is that even among those patients who had no past 30-day use of marijuana who were pregnant, between 2005 and 2015, they saw a real increase in the number who perceived that there was no, no risk to using marijuana in pregnancy. That went from 3.5% in 2005 to 16.5% in 2015. And that question is for no risk. Going over here, you see these past 30 day use who are non-pregnant. So people who aren't pregnant, they saw no risk in pregnancy. And interestingly, even those who are past 30 day use who were pregnant, people currently using, 65% of them said, yeah, I don't think there's any risk at all to using in pregnancy. So either they're just trying to deny that they think that there's a risk or we're not doing a good job of communicating risk. So how do we test for marijuana in pregnancy? There's a number of ways, usually honestly in pregnant women we use urine, especially during the antepartum period when they're still pregnant. Pregnant people have plenty of urine to give us um, and we can use urine, it's a reliable test. It's positive for two to three days in somebody who uses marijuana occasionally, but can be positive for weeks in somebody who uses marijuana more chronically. And so that's the tricky part about it. Some people, times people could have stopped but if they've been previously using chronically, their utox is gonna be positive for up to several weeks. Meconium is used and was typically used very often for assessment of neonatal exposure. Um, the thought is that it detects use from the second trimester onward. Um, hair uh, is not used very much in clinical practice. It is used for research purposes. Um, you just have to be careful about passive exposure make sure you strip the hair. Um, and also a lot of patients aren't super keen on getting a large portion of their hair lopped off to do drug testing. So that's why it's just not used as frequently. And then serum, it's similar to urine, um, two to three days in an occasional user. Umbilical cord homogenate is happening more and more in hospitals. And this is what we've converted to at my hospital. I know a number of hospitals have converted to this rather than meconium. Um, it similarly is thought to detect use from about the second trimester onward. Um, and it utilizes an otherwise discarded specimen. So obstetricians at the time of delivery take a cord segment. It usually looks like that. The reason we take it is to actually draw uh, blood gases off the cord to look at the acid-base status of the baby at the time of delivery. Um, but after that, it just gets thrown away. <clears throat> so once we've done what we would normally do with it clinically, it can be drained of blood. And that cord without the blood can be used to assess for uh, drug exposure. Um, it's easier to collect than meconium. You don't have to scoop baby poop for uh, days on end to get a full vial, um, but it's likely less uh, it's likely less sensitive. Or meconium 
is likely more sensitive than the cord. So if you really want a sensitive test to pick up small amounts of drug use, then meconium is going to be a better test. Um, but as a screening test, umbilical cord works well, is otherwise discarded and easy to collect. So now we're going to delve really into the studies that are out there. <clears throat> and you'll see from the title of the side, there's problems with the existing studies. Um, and what are those problems? First of all, there's usually a lack of quantification and timing of exposure. So we don't know when the patient used, how much they used. It's really just a yes, no, use marijuana didn't at some point during the pregnancy. That's not very helpful in terms of counseling patients. Um, and a lot of studies there's difficulty adjusting for tobacco, other drugs, and sociodemographic factors that also influence the outcomes that we're looking at. And there's this high reliance on self-report, which is a problem, right? I showed you the data that we had where um, only 2% of those patients had reported use to a healthcare provider and up to 20% of them actually had a positive umbilical cord. Um, there was a study, there are other studies demonstrating that uh, self-report is unreliable. There's a study in 1995 by Shiona and colleagues where they did a prospective cohort study with structured interviews and maternal serum toxicology screens. So in this case, it was blood. And what they found is that 70% of the women who had a positive THC on serum tox denied use in a structured interview. <clears throat> and remember, that's only positive for two to three days in an occasional user. So that means that somebody used within the past two to three days, and they said, nope, I haven't used. And I think that's really because there's a lot of social desirability to not use drugs during pregnancy and to not discuss the use of those drugs with your healthcare practitioners or researchers. This is another study demonstrating that self-report isn't great. Um, and I'm also gonna then show you slides subsequently that say that we rely on it almost exclusively for research in this area. Um, this is a retrospective cohort where they looked at data again. This is the same Kaiser Permanente Northern California cohort where they had about 280,000 women. They did urine toxicology screening on all of these patients in their first trimester entry to prenatal care. And it was positive in 5% of them, 4.9% but self-reported use was only 2.5%. So about double in this case, when they did a urine toxicology screen. And what they found was that being older, being of Hispanic and ethnicity and lower household income, were all associated with misclassification of not using cannabis by self-report, meaning that patients who are older, of Hispanic ethnicity or lower income were less likely to disclose use. This is a project um, that we did while I was in Colorado uh, in the Children's Adolescent Maternity Program, that's CAMP. Um, basically, it's a retrospective cohort of adolescents who underwent universal biologic sampling when they came in for prenatal care. Um, we wanted to evaluate if marijuana use was associated with a composite adverse pregnancy outcome, which included stillbirth, hypertensive disorders or high blood pressure in pregnancy, spontaneous preterm birth, or being small for gestational age, meaning being less than 10th percentile for uh, gestational in age and weight when they were born. The way we measured the marijuana exposure was by doing a urine toxicology. Um, and if it was positive for marijuana metabolites, then that was a positive. Or we also looked at self-reported use of marijuana on a uniformly administered questionnaire to these adolescents. And this is what we found. Overall, we had 1,206 adolescent uh, pregnancies that we included in this cohort. Of them, 17% were positive for marijuana. Again, high risk group, right? A high rate of marijuana use. But what's interesting is that when we look at these 204 marijuana exposed births or the 17% that were positive, we would have almost detected almost none of them if we just relied on self-report. So with self-report alone, only 11 of them would have been detected. But because of the urine toxicology screen, another 133 were detected. And then there were 60 that, sorry, so it would have been 71 total, 60 that had both a UTOX positive and self-report positive. But again, it's about threefold more um, when we actually did urine sampling versus just self-reported data. So who cares? Well, it matters when we're trying to interpret the literature. So when we do, we did multivariable modeling for the study in a variety of ways. The first thing we did is we just, we looked at marijuana use any. So if they had a UTOX positive or self-report positive, we found that it was associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes with an adjusted odds ratio of 
If we just took those that had self-reported use, so that 70 that self-reported use, we found that marijuana wasn't associated with the primary outcome at all. <clears throat> Adjusted odds ratio of 1.06, so like very negative study um, because we're missing all those patients who didn't tell us about the marijuana use. And then we looked at people who had more than one year in toxicology screen that was positive. That odds ratio for adverse pregnancy outcomes went up to 3.75. So potentially the issue of ongoing use really increasing that risk of adverse outcomes. And so I think this just demonstrates the issue with the literature is that if we just look at self-report alone, we might say, gosh, there's no association between marijuana use and any of these adverse outcomes. But when we have sampling with urine, other biologic specimens, we see, yep, it actually does increase. And when we have it serially and we see use over time, it really increases that risk of pregnancy, adverse pregnancy outcome. This is the other problem with the data that are out there. <clears throat> they all come from the 80s and 90s, or the majority come from the 80s and 90s. There's now been a resurgence of interest in marijuana use and pregnancy, and I'm going to cover the more recent studies with you guys as well. But the older studies are all from the 80s and 90s when the potency of marijuana products was much lower. And these slides are just to show you the other stuff that was going on in the 80s. This isn't going on anymore, right? We're not wearing leg warmers. We're not doing jazzercise and aerobics. We're not watching MTV or playing Pac-Man on Atari. All this has changed and so have the uh, marijuana products. The marijuana products today are much more potent. They're consumed in different ways. And so even if we have these data from the 80s and 90s, it's hard to know if it's really applicable at all to the products that, that patients are using today. Okay, so now we're just gonna kind of go one by one through some outcomes that have been studied a fair amount related to marijuana use and pregnancy. By far and away, the thing that's been most studied is fetal growth restriction. Um, or having a baby that's too small. Um, and the data are really mixed. Um, initially, there was a meta-analysis that sort of synthesized the data of the 80s and 90s. It was published in 1997. And they focused on the association between marijuana exposure and birth weight. And women who consume marijuana more than four times per week had babies that weighed less than non-users by about 131 grams on average. But when they did a pooled odds ratio for low birth weight or birth weight less than 2,500 grams, <clears throat> they didn't find an association between marijuana use and low birth weight. There's another study, um, the Generation R study, which I'm gonna talk about more later as well because they're looking at neurodevelopment. Um, but in the initial Generation R uh, data collection, they assessed fetal growth by ultrasound and they found that fetus is exposed to cannabis in early pregnancy, grew about 11 grams per week less than non-users and fetus is exposed to cannabis throughout the pregnancy, grew about 14 grams per week less than non-users. This is a retrospective cohort study where they compared patients who reported daily marijuana use with unexposed pregnancies matched by gestational age, and they found no difference in the first trimester or at the anatomic survey, which isn't surprising because we don't usually see growth differences until later in pregnancy. And in the third trimester, they saw a higher prevalence of fetal growth restriction in the marijuana exposed pregnancies, about 14% versus 3% in the rest of the population, which was significant. We similarly recently published a paper. We took the 9,000 nulliparous patients or patients who'd never had a baby who were enrolled in a prospective cohort study called New Mom to Be, where they basically enrolled 10,000 women and then followed them over time through their pregnancies, collected a bunch of data, collected a bunch of biospecimens. In this cohort, marijuana use was self-reported at about 1.5%. We know that that probably underestimates use, right? And so some people are being misclassified. But even with that misclassification, we saw differences in growth that started at 28 weeks. And the rate of small for gestational age was higher in the marijuana group, 22% versus 9% in a using a population-based growth curve, and 25% versus 14% using a customized growth curve. And this here just shows you the green is the marijuana use and the black is no marijuana use, and the x-axis is gestational age in weeks. And what you can see is they sort of start out together around 20 weeks, and you start to see that divergence in growth with the marijuana use um, weight percentile going down. And the stars is when it became significant. So for both kind of different population-based and customized standards of growth, fetal growth, we see that divergence start around 28 weeks. I do not expect you to read this slide. What this is, is just to draw your attention to the fact that we have published a pretty detailed uh, systematic uh, review on this topic. Um, it was published in the American Journal of OBGYN in 2015. So it's a little bit old. There definitely have been some new data since then, 
But if you really want to delve into what's out there and really see the studies, because there are a lot of them, um, there are nice tables in there that look like this that kind of talk you through, you know, what was the setting, how many patients participated, how did they acquire marijuana use, and then what the outcomes were. And I think that a couple of things I do want to draw your attention to, because the tables all look like this, the bright green would be a case where they say marijuana is associated with the outcome. So in this case, field growth restriction, bright green. Yep. So all the studies are bright green, it's associated. The ones that aren't, it's not. And so these are the mixed data that I told you about. Um, you can kind of find whatever you want in the literature and people will argue about, well, what about this study? What about this study? This showed no difference. We really do need to look at all of the literature and be able to synthesize it because there are mixed data out there. And then this red circle just shows you, this is the only one on this page that uses any biological sampling, all the rest was self-report. And we've already talked about the issues with that. But if you want to delve more into the details of the studies, that's where you can find it. So what about preterm birth? Um, these data are similarly mixed. Um, there's an Australian cohort who self-reported marijuana use at prenatal care intake, looking at that, 25,000 women. And they found that marijuana use was associated with preterm birth. There was another study that used ICD-10 codes for substance use. These are no notoriously under capture but they saw an increased incidence of preterm birth among marijuana users. And then ALSPAC, which is a UK study, the preterm birth rate was exactly the same among users and non-users, 4.6%. So again, mixed data makes it hard to interpret. This is kind of the flip side of that Shiono study that I talked about with you about earlier. In the Shiono study, only 31% of the women with a positive serum screen self-reported marijuana use in a structured interview. So this is the other way around, right? Patients were saying, yes, I've used marijuana, but only 31% of them had a positive blood test. So that's probably because of that short time window when it can be captured, like two to three days. Um, conversely, only 43% of the women who, who self-reported use had a positive serum screen. Sorry, that's the second one. That's the one that I was just referring to, my apologies. And there's no association with preterm birth with self-report and or serum screen positive. So the serum, when the serum was positive for THC, it was associated with preterm birth though. And what the author said was, well, maybe it's that those serum positive patients are the ones who maybe have more frequent use or heavier use. And that's how we captured it in the serum. And maybe that is bad. And that's why we're seeing this association with preterm birth. This is an old study though. There's been a lot since then. There are a couple of studies um, that are more recent that are worth mentioning. There's one out of France um, by Sorel and colleagues where they looked at prevalent at marijuana use and spontaneous preterm birth, they found 1% prevalence of use, which I think is concerning for under ascertainment of use, unless people in France really don't use marijuana, which I think is unlikely. I think they probably just under ascertained use. But they found that any marijuana use was associated with spontaneous preterm birth with an odds ratio of two. And then there's another study by Decker and colleagues, about 3,000 women. And in this study, they found 7% who are marijuana exposed by self report in structured interviews. I think that's closer, right? That's closer where we'd expect it to be. And pre-pregnancy use was associated with spontaneous preterm birth with intact membranes, meaning that they didn't break up their bag of water, they went into labor. There are a few studies that have come out more recently. This is a Canadian cohort of uh, about 600,000 patients. Um, prevalence of self-reported marijuana use was 1.4%. Again, probably too low, and they say that in the article. Um, rate of preterm birth among women with use, though, is 12% versus 6% in those without use. And they found a persistent association between marijuana use and preterm birth less than 37 weeks with a relative risk of 1.4, and a higher risk of early preterm birth at 32 to 37 weeks. I'm going to summarize those data for you shortly, but for now, I'm going to talk to you about stillbirth. So what about stillbirth? Data are limited. Um, there's a case control study, though, out of the Stillbirth Collaborative Research Network, which is an NICHD-funded network, and they found an association between stillbirth and marijuana use, as demonstrated by a cord homogenate positive for THC. So they actually did biologic sampling in this study, and they had an odds ratio of 2.3 for stillbirth with marijuana use. And after they adjusted for cotinine in the maternal serum to account for tobacco use, they found that they, this reduced the stillbirth odds ratio a little bit by about 10%, but marijuana use was still associated with stillbirth. Congenital anomalies. This is what patients always want to know, right? Well, is it associated with birth defects, especially when a lot of patients are using it in the first trimester uh, to help with nausea and vomiting of pregnancy? So the data are really limited and mixed for this. 
Um, there was a study in 1983 that found no association between marijuana and major malformation. <clears throat> but there have also been other large retrospective cohort studies that are based on birth defects registries. The problem with these larger studies based on birth defects registries is that they often have incomplete ascertainment of confounding factors, meaning that they don't ask about if a patient used uh, folic acid or if the patient had predestational diabetes or other things that predispose that patient to uh, congenital anomalies or risk factors for congenital anomalies. And there's also a potential for recall bias. Um, and this is like the perfect textbook medical school example of recall bias. You uh, call a patient a couple years after they have their baby, which is typically how these studies are done, and their baby's totally fine. And you say, did you have any exposure to marijuana? And they say, no, but they forgot that they basically smoked it through the whole first trimester of the pregnancy before they knew that they were pregnant, but like their baby's fine and they haven't thought about it since then. And then you call somebody whose baby has a heart defect and you say, did you have exposure to marijuana during pregnancy? And they remember that one time they walked through a parking lot when people were tailgating their people smoking pot and they walked by and they took a breath because they really had to breathe. And they say, yes. And that's exaggerated, but the reality is that people do rack their brain when their baby has something wrong as to the things they could have been exposed to or done that would have resulted in this outcome. And so it just really results in a lot of bias. That's not to say these studies aren't on value. They definitely are. And it's a valuable way to look for these things. Um, but we just have to keep that in mind. There is one study that I think is worth mentioning where they did a nice job of controlling for confounders. This is an Atlanta birth defects registry. They found 122 cases of ventricular septal defects, which is a heart defect, um, and 3,000 controls. And after they adjusted for those confounders, maternal age, race, overt diabetes, vitamin use, they found that periconceptional marijuana use was associated with ventricular septal defects, an odds ratio of 1.9. But they said more data are needed. This is an adequate evidence of one of association with a specific congenital birth defect. And I haven't seen any data since then validating or refuting this. So what about NICU admission? This is a hot topic recently. Um, this is a study of about 6,500 women. Uh, there were 6,100 without use and 361 with use. And they found an increased risk of NICU admission, 12% versus 17%. We similarly did a secondary analysis looking at the live births that were part of the stillbirth network database. So they had live birth controls and we looked at those. We found marijuana use in about 2.7% of these births. And we looked at a primary composite adverse pregnancy outcome of hypertension, stillbirth, small for gestational age, and spontaneous preterm birth. And this was similar between those who used and didn't use, although it was 31% versus 21%. We just had a small sample size. And so that wasn't enough to detect a difference. But interestingly, we saw similar rates of NICU admission to that other study. So 17% among those who used any marijuana versus about 9% without. That wasn't statistically significant. But what was, was our composite neonatal morbidity or death, 14% versus 4.4%. Um, and that was significant. And even after we modeled that morbidity, neonatal morbidity, we found an adjusted odds ratio of three for marijuana use. So this would mean there's no difference. And out here we see this marijuana use. And so I think that that's, that's a pretty big odds ratio. And I think warrants some attention in terms of how marijuana could be associated with neonatal morbidity. So I've presented a bunch of confusing data. I've told you guys that it's mixed. I've given you some examples where it's positive, some where it's negative. So how do we kind of put that together to really know what we should be talking to patients and women in the community about? Um, really, we typically do that by summarizing the data. So doing that with a uh, systematic review and meta-analysis. There's a couple of meta-analyses that have come out, uh, both of them in 2016, that um, have summarized the data to that point. There's subsequently been some more studies, but I think these are good summaries. So this is a study that was done by Gunn and colleagues. They did a systematic review and meta-analysis. And they said they would look at any maternal, fetal, or neonatal up to six weeks postpartum outcomes after cannabis exposure. And that they would do a meta-analysis or a pooling of those data when there are three or more studies available with the same outcome. And ultimately, they were able to look at all those outcomes that are listed there. And they found increased odds of maternal anemia, low birth weight, and NICU admission among um, neonates uh, and mothers are exposed to cannabis in, pre in pregnancy. But they said, gosh, we thought we'd find more than this um, that were high quality and that we could pull and we didn't. So more studies are needed. 
There's another study where Shannon Connor and colleagues also performed a systematic review and meta-analysis, right, published within a couple of months of each other. Um, and their aim was more specific. They wanted to estimate if marijuana use increases the risk of adverse neonatal outcomes with primary outcomes of low birth weight and preterm birth and number of secondary outcomes. Out of all the studies that are out there, which is hundreds to thousands, they found 31 studies that they felt were high enough quality to include in this meta-analysis, 12 on low birth weight and 14 on preterm birth. And their pooled unadjusted data demonstrated an association between marijuana use and low birth weight and preterm birth. And you can see the actual numbers there. But after they adjusted for tobacco and other confounders, they said, there's not an association anymore. We're not, we're not seeing it. But keep in mind, these are self-report studies for the most part. But they did a planned sub-analysis of moderate to heavy use defined at, at least one per week. And in those cases, marijuana use was associated with both low, low birth weight and preterm birth. And these are the data that are included in the ACOG American College of OBGYN's committee opinion on this saying, you know, this makes us worried and we should really tell women not to use marijuana in pregnancy. This is a, uh, another summary article that I wrote along with one of my colleagues, Dr. Laura Bergelt, who's a pharmacist. Um, we wrote this one in 2018, so it's a little more recent. And I think if you want to just kind of read something that's lighter, that's not just a summary of a bunch of data and tables and studies, this kind of walks you through a lot of the things that we're covering today. This is one of the figures from that publication. And what you can see is as you go through these different outcomes, low birth weight, preterm birth, anemia, NICU, SGA, et cetera, we plotted the odds ratios from both the gun meta-analysis and the Connor meta-analysis. And here is one. So if anything crosses one, you'd say it's not significant. Anything to the right would say, you know, that's bad. There, there might be an association between marijuana use and that outcome. And anything to the left would say it's actually beneficial potentially. And what you see here is that, yep, a lot of these do cross one, but all these are over on the right. And so I think that, you know, the, the data overall would suggest that, you know, there are likely risks of marijuana use in pregnancy and we should be advising patients against it. This is looking at birth weight. And here you can see that this would be no difference in birth weight. And this, and here what you see is that there is a difference in birth weight in both these studies with a decrement in the marijuana group. Um, and that is becoming more and more consistent across studies. And I, I think that that's probably the thing that we have the most evidence for related to marijuana use in pregnancy is lower birth weights. So what about neurodevelopment? This is something that people are really worried about. And definitely the pediatricians are very worried about. Um, this is a Time Magazine that came out looking at uh, the world of uh, pot science. And I must have gotten, you know, 50 copies of this when it came out because when I was starting to investigate marijuana use and pregnancy. Now I just use it as a fun transition slide. I don't actually do animal work. Um, but looking at uh, neurodevelopment, there is some animal work out there that's notable. So there are alterations in neurotransmitters and rat models, especially in the dopaminergic pathways. Um, there's a very interesting study from Yasmin Hurd and colleagues looking at postpartum human fetal brains of elective terminations at 17 to 22 weeks. And what they see is dopamine receptors are reduced in marijuana exposed fetuses, and that it's most prominent in males, and that it's directly correlated with the amount of marijuana use during pregnancy. And this is what people are worried about. The endocannabinoid system is really active during fetal neural development, and we worry about exogenous cannabis coming in and interacting with that system and um, creating aberrant pathways. There are a few prospective longitudinal studies assessing neurodevelopment in the offspring of, um, of women who use marijuana during pregnancy. There's one out of Ottawa that had low risk European American middle-class population. There's one out of Pittsburgh that had a high risk, more mixed ethnicity population, predominantly African-American. And then there's Generation R study out of the Netherlands that's ongoing, which is much larger, uh, multi-ethnic, uh, but mostly higher socioeconomic class. So what's the problem with the neurodevelopment data where we look at these longitudinal studies over time? They're limited by confounding. And that doesn't mean that the investigators didn't do everything they could to adjust for all the things. It just means that it's really hard to adjust for everything that happens to a child from the time that they're born until the time we're measuring these outcomes at four, 10, 12 years of age. 
you know, there are a lot of other things that contribute to their neurodevelopment, their home environment, what's happening at school, other exposures, things that it's just really hard to track over time to say, oh, we think this is because of in utero exposure. So the Ottawa data um, said that there are no differences between groups below age four in terms of neurodevelopment. But starting at age four, they saw increased behavioral problems, worse language comprehension, decreased sustained attention and memory. And the Pittsburgh data showed decreased verbal re reasoning at age six, worse academic performance at age 10, and increased substance use at age 14. The Generation R study, which is still ongoing, showed higher aggression scores in marijuana exposed girls, but not boys at 18 months, and no differences in behavior at three years of age. And they're doing ongoing follow-up of this cohort into adulthood for children that were born between 2002 and 2006. So hopefully they'll continue to be data. This um, drew a fair amount of media attention when it came out. It's a retrospective cohort study using a birth registry out of Ontario, Canada from 2007 to 2012. The rate of cannabis use was 0.6%. And the incidence of autism spectrum disorder diagnosis was four per thousand person years with exposure compared to 2.4 among the unexposed with an adjusted hazard ratio of 1.51, but they urge cautious interpretation because there's likely residual confounding as we mentioned. This is another study that was published in JAMA Psychiatry. It's a cross-sectional study of about 11,000 children. The Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Study or the ABCD study, which many of you are probably familiar with. There was 6% exposed to cannabis prenatally. Mean age at follow-up was 10 years. Um, cannabis exposure after maternal knowledge of pregnancy was associated with greater psychotic-like experiences and externalizing attention, thought, and social problems in the offspring. So in summary, um, the number of people have tried to sum it all up. Um, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment tried to do this when marijuana was first legalized. There was a big campaign to educate people about use in pregnancy. Um, what they found when they did the literature review is a lot of the same things that I've conveyed to you all today, but you can also find their systematic review online if you just search Good to Know Colorado or CDPHG um, marijuana. And what they found is decreased growth. Um, some of these I didn't go into just for time, but decreased cognitive function, decreased academic ability and attention problems. Limited evidence for stillbirth, right? We just had that one study, but it's a well done study. Uh, here's that simple ventricular septal defects that I talked to you about. And then mixed evidence for a lot of things we discussed, preterm birth, decreased birth weight overall, meaning like low birth weight, uh, newborn behavior issues, uh, breastfeeding and infant motor development, birth defects, including neural tube or gastroschisis. There are some studies that say yes, some studies say no, and a lot of them don't adjust for confounding like the one I shared with you. Um, and then we didn't talk about frequency of use in adolescents. There's also a really nice National Academy of Sciences report on the health effects of cannabinoids or cannabis. Um, I, I would uh, recommend that you look at this if you have interest in this topic. There's a whole chapter on pregnancy and marijuana use. And after they reviewed all the information that's out there, they said there seems to be a consistent association between prenatal cannabis use and lower birth weight in the offspring. There's limited evidence of an association between cannabis use and NICU admission. And they didn't think there was sufficient evidence of an association with can cannabis use and neurocognitive outcomes. And that's because they said, we talked about, we just can't adjust for all those subtle environmental differences. So it's really hard to sort that out and blame it on the in utero cannabis exposure. So what about breastfeeding? <clears throat> marijuana does pass to, or marijuana metabolites pass to the neonate in the breast milk. Um, Initially, there was just a letter to the editor in the New England Journal of Medicine that had two patients. And this is what we, I'd hear people quote, all the time for when uh, marijuana was legalized in 2014. People would say, oh, well, it can be up to eight times the plasma, uh, eight times the level in the plasma. And then when you really dug into it, you're like, oh, well, that was in one patient. Um, and so we really just didn't have data. Um, there's a little bit more data now, but not a ton. Uh, there was an observational study of eight women that was published where patients were asked to pur purchase a product with a known concentration of THC from a Colorado dispensary. And then they were asked to abstain from use for 24 hours prior to using this product. And they inhaled cannabis and then collected breast milk at 20 minutes, one, two, and four hours. And they found that exclusively breastfed infants ingested a mean of 2.5% of maternal dose. So there was cross of metabolite into the breast milk, but at low volumes. There's another study uh, in the journal Pediatrics. 
where they took 54 samples from milk donors and they found that uh, Delta 9 THC or uh, THC metabolite, the most stable metabolite was detected in 63% of samples up to six days after last reported use with a median concentration of 9.5 nanograms per milliliter. And not surprisingly, they found the number of daily uses and the time from sample collection to analysis were predictors of how much marijuana concentrated in the breast milk. I worked on a prospective cohort study that was published in JAMA PEDS um, to estimate the time to elimination from marijuana metabolite from the breast milk. Um, the, one of the inclusion criterion that we had was that they had to plan to be abstinent. And we found that only half of them were able to achieve that, even though they said, yeah, I'm not going to use it anymore. I'm definitely going to be abstinent. I can do this time to elimination study. Only half of them were able to achieve that. And they were primarily inhaling um, marijuana as their conception method during the pregnancy, most of them more than two times per week. And we found detectable THC in breast milk in all participants throughout the whole six-week study period. We had 402 serial samples that we obtained and analyzed. The half-life for uh, marijuana metabolites was about 17 days with a projected elimination, total elimination time of more than six weeks. So unfortunately, fortunately, this tells us that patients can't just pump and dump, right? We can't tell them like, oh, it's okay to smoke marijuana, pump your next feed, and then it's gone. That's not true. Uh, this is probably because marijuana is very lipophilic or fat loving and breast milk has a lot of fat. And so it probably just hangs around in there longer than it would in other body, body compartments. This is a study where they tried to look at neurodevelopment in babies who are exposed via breast milk. And they found that exposed infants scored poorly on psychomotor developmental index compared to non-exposed. But they said, we can't really separate this from prenatal exposure because 84% of the women who use while pregnant continued to use while breastfeeding. So it's just hard to sort it out. The American Academy of Pediatrics says that breastfeeding is contraindicated in women using illicit drugs, including marijuana. ACOG, the American College of OBGYN says women should not use marijuana during pregnancy or while lactating and that OB-GYN should not prescribe for medicinal purposes to pregnant or lactating women, and that there's insufficient effects, evidence for effects on the nursing infant. Um, this was published in 2015. The studies I shared with you about breastfeeding have come up subsequent to that time. So there are some updates, but we know that it crosses and it probably crosses in small amounts. Unfortunately, it hangs around for a long time. So how are we doing now in terms of counseling women about marijuana use in pregnancy? The answer is poorly. Um, these are really interesting data uh, that were published in 2016 where they recorded actual patient encounters and evaluated the obstetric provider's response to a disclosure of marijuana use. So the patient says, I have marijuana use, and then they saw what the provider said in response in real encounters. And 19% of the, these patients reported marijuana use of their intake. So high risk, high use population, 47 different healthcare providers, Almost half the time, 48% of the time, the provider didn't even respond to the disclosure. They just went on to the next question. So the patient said, yeah, I use it. They didn't even say anything at all. Just next question. When they did discuss it, uh, their response was really nonspecific and it was focused on talk screens, social services, punishments, which isn't a way to help patients learn about risks, find out why they're using, offer them safe, safe alternatives. These are some of the quotes. You know how it alters your mind when you have it, how it makes you feel. So think about what it's doing to that baby that's not even formed yet. It gets the effects as well. And we don't want to do that to the baby. So that's not helpful. What does that mean? That's totally nonspecific. I don't know what the patient would take away from that. Um, issue with marijuana is specifically just that it's illegal. So at the time of delivery, they'll do a urine drug test because you have a history of using it. If it's positive at the time of delivery, they'll often have you like force you to talk to child protective services because it's a risk factor. Risk factor for what? And this basically just tells the patient like, glad you told me that, but never tell me that again. So it really doesn't allow any kind of open lines of communication about use. This is a study where they had 33 pregnant or postpartum people who had reported daily use during pregnancy. Interestingly, most did not disclose use to their healthcare providers because they were scared of child protective services referrals and feared judgment by healthcare providers. And it typically wasn't addressed by their provider. And when it was, it was mixed messages and legal threats. So patients say the same thing that was found in that Holland study with the reported encounters. The problem is that if healthcare practitioners aren't talking to patients, then somebody else is. Um, this was a dispensary project that we did. It was a mystery shopper study where we called 400 randomly selected dispensaries, told them we were eight weeks pregnant with nausea, 
and nearly 70% of them had product recommendations for that color. They recommended edibles, 65% of them said their recommendation was based on personal opinion, meaning they said personally, or I think, or in my experience, or um, things like that. And only 32% recommended discussion with a healthcare provider without prompting to a pregnant patient who was seeking cannabis uh, products. So how do we get better information out there? There are guidelines for providers and resources to help us. So I, even though it's older now, because this was really a big push when marijuana was legalized in 2014 in Colorado, it's still a great resource. Good to know Colorado.com. Um, they have handouts like this for um, just giving patients information because a lot of times people say, well, I just don't have time to talk to a patient about that. Well, at least just give them a fact sheet about it or say, you know, that's not something we'd recommend. Why are you using it? And see if you can offer them a different alternative. And what do we tell them? There's really no known benefits of marijuana use in pregnancy. There are possible risks of marijuana use in pregnancy. So we really wanna advise patients not to use it. There's no known safe amount of marijuana in pregnancy and that's because the data are just limited. Um, we don't know when people used or how much or how that contributes to adverse outcomes. So we need more research. Biologic sampling is gonna be critical along with timing and quantification of exposure. We need more information about congenital malformations, maternal morbidity, and neonatal morbidity, including NICU admission, because we've seen some signals there. I do want to recognize that I've shared with you a number of original research works um, that uh, I have worked on. These were funded. Um, I, they were initially funded through the CCTSI, Child Maternal Health Junior Pilot Program at the University of Colorado. I was also a women's reproductive health research scholar and a K-12 at University of Colorado for some of the um, some of the work I presented, and now I'm uh, on a NIDA R01 looking at the association between marijuana use and adverse pregnancy outcomes. So I want to also to let you guys know that in the PDF, there's a ton of references if you have interest in reading more about this. And I want to thank you for your time. And if we have any questions in the chat, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much. All right, I do see a question here. Um, what would be your recommendation regarding NICU accepting milk for a newborn from baby's mother who's using marijuana? All right, this is a really hot button topic and I think there's very various, um, very strong opinions on this. That was one of the things that prompted the study that I did with Erica Wymore, who is a neonatologist um, that was published in JAMA Peds. She felt really strongly that milk shouldn't be accepted from moms who are using marijuana and really wanted to see how long it would take to eliminate that marijuana metabolite. Unfortunately, it looks like it takes a really long time. Um, now, it is a really long time in really small amounts. And so I, I know that some NICUs also have policies about saying like, you know, I know that there are concerns about that marijuana metabolite passes into my milk. I've stopped but I still want to give, um, provide milk to my baby and accept those risks. So I know that some people have taken that tactic. Um, I think that most people feel like breast milk with a small amount of marijuana is better than no breast milk, but that is highly controversial. Um, but we have to remember that it is in very small amounts. We definitely wanna encourage women to stop. We want them to understand that it takes a long time for it to be eliminated. So pump and dump isn't an option. Um, but I think people feel like you know, if it's the only option, we shouldn't be withholding lactation support from the, those patients. Um, if there are other options, sometimes patients and providers may choose those. So if there's milk bank that's tested, then that would be another option. But I think that's another important thing is not all milk banks test. And so you may be making it so a mom can't give her own breast milk, um, but then using somebody else's that wasn't even tested. And so I think it just, it really depends on where the milk is coming from, how the patient's being counseled. Um, and I've seen NICUs take different approaches to it. I know that is not a straight answer, but that is a super controversial question. Okay, we have another question. Okay, are data on prenatal marijuana exposure available from Medicaid data? Um, the only way I think you would get that is from, I don't know specifically from Medicaid data, but any kind of administrative large database, you're gonna be um, stuck with just uh, ICD data, so substance use coding, and that is hard. I've done some other work with substance use and looking at codes for substance use with one of my colleagues here in Utah, and it is way undercoded. Um, you know, it has to, it relies on a provider actually having coded for marijuana use, 
which I think often they don't, or they do only in really egregious circumstances, like very high use, other concerns kind of circumstances. And so I think it really biases the capture. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, I'd advocate for whenever possible, trying to do this with biologic sampling and not doing that in a biased way where you just sample people you think use, but really sampling everybody. And I know that's hard and that costs a lot of money and um, we're working on it. Okay, well, um, I don't see any additional questions. So um, we will thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and your experience and research in this um, really important topic. And we look forward to hearing your future um, results and, and what happens going forward. So thank you so much. And uh, we will um, just remind everyone that we are going to send out a recording of this to all the uh, people who attended. And we will include the PowerPoint presentation as well. I know some of that data was a little I, I'm just trying to absorb it and then it's then this, you're going on to the next slide. So I think it'll it'll be helpful to many. So thank you so much. And uh, this will uh, conclude our webinar. So have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.